The following program explores drug use and abuse throughout history. Viewer discretion is advised. Why do we use drugs? And just how far back does our relationship with drugs go? Tell me, prehistoric man used magic mushrooms? Stone Age doings. Which ancient civilizations took drugs to induce trances? So it's almost like it's a, a, a giant Greek rave. And which we're hoping to journey to another world. It is real. You're just perceiving in a, in a broader spectrum. Which drugs fueled some empires while poisoning others? And when did the government finally step in and say, enough? Well, you burn all this stuff? We burn it all. That's a lot of burning weed, man. Were the hard drugs of today always considered hard drugs? And how are we supposed to know which drugs are safe to put in our bodies? Now you're giving me anxiety. You guys have any drugs for anxiety? Hi, I'm Dean Norris, and I'm on drugs. But so is my mother, so is my doctor, and actually, so is my dog. And I'm willing to bet if you're living in the 21st century, then so are you. But hey, don't take my word for it. Let's take a journey through the Stone Ages. Today, we have thousands of drugs at our fingertips. But what about 20,000 years ago? Did early man knowingly use drugs in order to alter their mind or body? How would they have found them? What drugs would they have used? We, as a people, have been using drugs as long as human beings have walked on two feet. Because drugs are found all around you. It's the poppies or the coca plant or the tobacco leaf that happens to be growing near where you live. The plants that we have today are pretty much plants that would be found 20,000 years ago with one important exception being domesticated plants, all our wheats and barleys. So no, they weren't making beer out of barley 20,000 years ago because they weren't growing fields of barley. But what was the first drug that humans experienced? The existence of pretty trippy rock art from prehistoric times might be a clue. The rock art often includes very simple forms that resemble the forms that people see when they're in altered states of consciousness. Psychedelics have been around longer than human beings have been around. I believe, and a lot of other people believe, that they've been used throughout history. The cave paintings and the cave uh, carvings uh, point to that. Mankind has, in various cultures throughout the world, have been using, ingesting, what we call magic mushrooms. I think it's, it's a natural thing for people to, to take these mushrooms because people are foragers. People forage for food, and uh, it's natural that they would try new things. Are these the same mushrooms painted on cave walls? We can't really know for sure. But then again, it's not like they were painting any carrots and onions. There must have been something really special about mushrooms for early man. But just what was it? I'm going on a mushroom hunt to find out. So I, I understand why people go treasure hunting. Why, why, why do people go mushroom hunting? Well, the thrill of gourmet wild mushrooms is really something, but uh, many other types of mushrooms would have mind-altering compounds, such as hallucinogenic fungi. So this is what people call magic mushrooms? Yes, that is one vernacular term for them. These could be called magic mushrooms, or to the Indians who use them, the sacred fungi. So when do you think man first used mushrooms? I mean, how far back does it go? It is likely that there have been encounters, at least in some places in time, all the way back to prehistory. Prehistoric man used magic mushrooms? Stone Age doings. What makes them magical? They have mind-altering effects. They induce an altered state of consciousness. What is that active ingredient? Well, the active ingredient is psilocybin. Psilocybin is a hallucinogenic compound that affects serotonin levels in the brain. It causes nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness, and an inability to distinguish fantasy from reality. So how do you think early man would have discovered the, these, these mushrooms? Well, in some ways, uh, trial and error, uh, accidental discovery. On the other hand, something with that type of yeah. effect might have been the object of a, a very deliberate search, keeping an eye out. Somebody stumbled upon it, and then they wanted to stumble upon it again. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So how do you think mushrooms came to be considered sacred? 
there is something inherent in the effect of these hallucinogenic fungi, which is often powerful enough to completely change their outlook on ultimate matters of life. And we don't know what that religious impulse is. It is something that cannot be explained in other terms, apparently. Wow. We don't know for sure if early man experimented with mushrooms, but there's certainly a lot of speculation. One controversial view is that mind-expanding experiences with magic mushrooms may have helped humans evolve. In psychedelic academic circles, this is called the stoned ape theory. It seems probable that psychoactive plants played an important role in human evolution. You get smarter if you use psychedelics in the right way. You think better, you think more clearly, you can see relationships in nature. You watch where a seed has been, you see something has grown there, so you start collecting seeds. Uh, you know, monkeys don't do this at this point, but a psychedelic monkey might have done that. So a whole new way of being on the planet may have started with psychedelics. Mankind's experience with a psychoactive plant may have been the primordial religious experience, the beginning of man's suspicion that there's another world. Humans have been using hallucinogenic drugs to try to connect with a higher power for thousands of years. But did they do this deliberately, or did they just stumble into these altered states in their search for food? All right, so what do you say we uh, go find us some mushrooms? Sounds about right to me. <laughs> All right, what are we looking for? Well, here in Florida, the species that is so renowned is called Psilocybe cubensis. Well, I see some mushrooms right over there, actually. Mm-hmm, those do look like mushrooms. Yeah, are those the ones we're looking for? They're not psilocybe cubensis. The mushrooms we're seeing right here could be deadly poisonous. Wow. Based on what I'm seeing at a glance. Ooh, nice. Look at that. The most dangerously poisonous amanitas tend to be white in color, white right. gills, white stalk, and they have that sack-like base. So if I'm looking to, to, to have a religious experiment, this is not the guy. Yeah, this is something you want to not eat, no matter what your purpose. Yeah. You're interested in seeing these hallucinogenic fungi, like psilocybe cubensis? Oh, you know I am. Well, uh, we take our chances, leave this habitat, and go to a pasture setting off this way, because that's where our best chances lie, I think. Well, let's go check it out. All right. Apparently, the recent rains make for perfect mushroom hunting conditions. Am I mistaken, or is that poop? That is cow manure. That yeah. is excrement. Dung, poop. Do the magic mushrooms ever grow from the poop? Oh, they, they prefer it. Out of the most foul and filthy arises psilocybe cubensis. The mushrooms are growing in the poop? Yes. Yeah, and people eat that? Yes, the Indians call some of them angelitos, little angels. Yeah. But I'm still eating the mushroom from poop. I wish I knew exactly what we were looking for. I could help you here. I'm just going to point out mushrooms as I see them. It seems very confusing to me. 90% of what we see when we look at a mushroom is trying to fool us. Yeah. For instance, these mushrooms right here, this genus is Panaeolus, but it looks like it could be. Could be. With Psilocybe cubensis, what we would see is dark purple. What happens if you eat that? You might feel a moment of uh, confusion. You're not going to get high. No, you're not, but some guys who tried getting high on it, they, they ate it, and then all of a sudden they experienced some kind of real tremor, and it was like the engine of a Saturn V rocket firing up, and they said, oh my god, Houston, we better strap in for this. This is going to be quite a blast off. They got ready. All of a sudden there was a sputtering sound. That was the end of their trip. <laughs> Hours into the hunt, there's plenty of cow dung, plenty of fungi, but no magic in sight. I'm beginning to wonder if I'll ever get to see the real thing. Ooh, oh yeah, look at that, Eureka. Have drugs done more to help us or harm us? What role have drugs played in shaping who we are today? How did our ancestors stumble across drugs in the first place? Let's continue our journey through the Stoned Ages. Out here in the Florida pastures, it's getting more humid by the minute. And I'm beginning to doubt that early man could have eaten magic mushrooms if they were this hard to find. Do you think the magic mushrooms are a, a drug or, or, or a medicine? Concepts like drug and medicine are partly defined by culture pattern. In our society, medicine is inherently understood as good. In native society, you will hear concepts such as good medicine and bad medicine, meaning which, uh, see what that one is now. Yeah. Does that look blue to you? It sure does. 
It looks blue to me, too. We're looking for psilocybe cubensis. That's not what this is, but that could be Copelandia, in my opinion. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Look at that. This particular form, if that is a good blue color on the cap, and it looks like yeah, it, yeah. contains psilocybin, is as strongly hallucinogenic as psilocybin cubensis. But this could be what we call Copelandia. Eureka. So you like holding the magic mushroom in your hand? In my opinion, more likely than not, yes. So this is the part where I arrest you for possession. I'm just kidding. You're looking at drugs and you're asking, is there evidence that our human ancestors used drugs to induce altered states of consciousness? Can we prove that or disprove that? And unfortunately, the answer is we can't because we don't have the plant remains. So there's no remaining organic evidence for drug use in early hunter-gatherer cultures. Their rock art may be trippy, but that doesn't really prove much. I hope the civilizations that followed left me more clues. Egypt in antiquity was considered the medicine cabinet of the world. They knew the intricacies of a great number of toxins, psychoactive substances. The earliest texts we have tend to be about 3,500 years old. One of them is called the Ebrus Papyrus, and it consists of knowledge that doctors have been picking up for a 1,000 years. Written around 1550 BC, the Ebers Papyrus is one of the oldest medical documents in the world. It mentions dozens of familiar substances used as makeshift remedies. Garlic to shrink hemorrhoids, dill to soothe flatulence, and honey for respiratory problems. It also lists a surprising home remedy used to quiet babies, opium. Hey, whatever works. Opium has been a wonderful a pain reliever, and it's been a, a boon to mankind. This container is called a bill bill. And you find things like this all over Egypt. If you look at the shape, you put it upside down, it looks just like a poppy capsule. And these straight lines all over it, that's the kind of scraping you would do to get the opium out of a poppy capsule. Aside from discovering magical medicines, Egyptians also used substances in magical ceremonies. Among these substances were frankincense and myrrh. Most people recognize frankincense and myrrh because they were the gifts given to Jesus at his birth. And when breathed in a uh, closed environment, they'd be quite powerful. The Egyptians are well aware of the use of frankincense as a means of motivating statues. They would allow the god to speak through the statue. And apparently, both the Egyptians and the Greeks were able to do this by fumigating their audiences with intense, heavy amounts of frankincense. Who knows if frankincense and myrrh could get statues talking to each other today? But a recent scientific study on mice does indicate that frankincense and myrrh might actually reduce pain and alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety. I know people who have experimented with frankincense, and it's, it's psychoactive. The ancient Egyptians used drugs as medicine and for magical ceremonies. But did they ever just take drugs for fun? And the ancient Egyptians had several festivals every year when they were intended to get very smashed. There were festivals of drunkenness for the goddess Hathor. You were meant to drink a whole lot of red beer. The Egyptians took their beer pretty seriously and wanted to make sure they'd always be fully stocked. This is a 6,000-year-old Egyptian beer mug. And someone made this to put in the tomb of his friend so that his friend would have beer for all eternity. The prayer we write on tombstones is rest in peace. The ancient Egyptians said, may you be given bread and beer. The ancient Egyptians built the pyramids, designed cities, and ruled for thousands of years. And clearly, drugs played a part in their lives. But there was another pyramid-building civilization across the world whose drug use may have taken them on far greater trips. I've heard the ancient Maya were into all sorts of crazy drugs. Let's try to find out if it's true. Wow, so this is Copan. This is Copan, one of the great cities of the ancient Maya. And they built these monumental temples uh, all over what's today Guatemala, Belize, Western El Salvador and Honduras, and, and Southern Mexico. 
So this is a very advanced society. Extremely advanced society. Lush plant life, all those fierce looking statues. Come on, this place has promise. And then this is and Temple this. 11. Look yeah. at this, what is this? The idea was to get closer to the heavens where the deities dwell, where the gods dwell. Should we uh, get closer ourselves? Well, let's do it. Well, they're an advanced society. Do they have an elevator? Or... No. Uh, no, no elevators, but uh, they probably would have been carried up. Nice. <laughs> so the Maya built their pyramids to get closer to the gods. Were they using drugs for the same purpose? We're almost there. To find out, we have to get high ourselves. I'm, of course, talking about the altitude. The pre-Columbian cultures of the Western Hemisphere had a rich variety of natural psychotropic substances to use, and they did use in worship and ritual throughout South America and Central America. If these indigenous cultures knew they were surrounded by psychoactive plants, I'm guessing Copan was no exception. It's really the, the one great Maya city that's up in the mountains. It's like a mountain kingdom. Some people will talk about it as though it's the Maya Shangri-La. Yeah. It's kind of hard to imagine what it would have been like to live here. What, what do we know about the way they felt about drugs? Well, they were agriculturalists. Yeah. So they had a really uh, fine understanding of, of the plant world. Yeah. And it's pretty solid evidence that they ingested psychoactive plants. Psychoactive plants. Yeah. They obviously must have known they had narcotic effects. You know, through experimentation and trial and error over centuries and centuries, people really understood what a plant or a mushroom could do. Yeah. The Maya left us clues to the drugs they may have used in their mushroom art. But if they did use psychedelics, what sort of experiences were they looking for? And why? The idea is to commune with the deities, commune with the gods. So if you could commune with them and, and gain uh, counsel and advice from them, that's pretty powerful. And this would go along with, uh, with different types of bloodletting and sacrifice and things like this yeah. as well. Bloodletting? Bloodletting. OK, so let's say you're king. OK. King of the, king king of the Maya Kopung. It's good to be king. It's good, good to be, be king. king. Yes, it's what would I do? King. What would you do? Well, you take out your genitals and uh, using a, a very prestigious object, a stingray spine, traded, yeah. traded all the way from the oceans, yeah. you would pierce your genitals, yeah. <laughs> take it easy, yeah. and, uh, and then you would let the blood flow onto bark paper okay. inside a ceramic bowl, and then you'd light that on fire, and yeah. then the, the smoke uh, with your blood would be offered up as a, an offering. Wow, maybe yeah. it's not so good to be king. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I can see how that would lead to an altered state. Wouldn't there be an easier way, like just taking some mushrooms or something? <laughs> well, it's, it's probable that there, that there were some uh, psychotropic plants or mushrooms involved in, in a lot of these rituals yeah. as well. Kings were probably effectively shamans, yeah. achieving visionary states, uh, traveling into the other realm, things like this. And inducing altered states with mushrooms would have been you know, a really good way to be a shaman. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Help, you help, help you talk to the dead with magic mushrooms. Very quickly, very easily. <laughs> <laughs> if the Maya were so advanced, I wonder if they'd also discovered new ways to ingest drugs. There seems to be some pretty good evidence that, uh, that they were using tobacco and ritual enemas. Oh, hey. Yeah. What? Why do we consider psychoactive drugs so dangerous? Didn't the ancient Maya use them to commune with the gods? Supposedly, these people even buried their dead with narcotic plants. Alan's taking me down into Copan's subterranean tomb so I can see for myself. Today in archaeology, we use a lot of hard science. And one of the most important hard science techniques yeah. is to actually look for evidence of botanical specimens, to actually understand what kinds of plants were used in the, in the rituals you know, for a burial, for right. example. Some archaeologists are looking for this for evidence of psychoactive and uh, highly visionary plants. Right. Yeah, this is good because this shows the offering niches where there would have been offerings, including offerings of plants. Gotcha. So we could tell that these plants were important because they were buried with them. Exactly. 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 Tell me about some other plants with narcotic properties that the, the Maya may have used. Tobacco would have been a prominent plant. and They smoked tobacco? This is, of course, uh, you could smoke it, but there seems to be some pretty good evidence that, uh, that they were using tobacco in ritual enemas. Oh, hey. Yeah. What? I mean, this is right. I mean, if you consider that the bowel is, is really mm. blood rich, yes. you, know, you can deliver a chemical compound mm. really fast and really effectively yeah. uh, through an enema. This was a serious ritual business. It sounds serious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, a tobacco enema probably would have delivered the equivalent of, say, 20 or 30 or 40 
of our cigarettes. And, and this would have induced a dramatic visionary uh, state, altered state of consciousness. Oh, I, I think uh, a bunch of tobacco stuck up my butt in an enema would deliver a visionary state. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ooh. The Maya had some pretty creative ways to induce altered states, but none of them really sound very pleasant. Clearly, if you're taking tobacco enemas and if you're piercing your, your genitals, this wasn't a recreational thing. No, this wasn't a recreational thing. I mean, this was, this was uh, highly structured, highly ordered, uh, ritual uh, practices. So for the Maya, these, these plants helped you commune with God. In fact, they were gods. You actually take the, the divine God into your body and commune with it. If the Maya believed they were taking their gods into their bodies when they ingested drugs, did other indigenous cultures feel the same way? I mean, you have to imagine all these cultures developed in the jungle, in the Americas. There's probably 10 times as many psychoactive plants as we find in other parts of the world. Wow. Seems like it. When we consider the incredible biodiversity of the Amazon, you know, we can start to understand why there are so many psychoactive plants in the Americas, like ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a hallucinogenic plant brew that developed over thousands of years of experimentation by South American tribes seeking spiritual enlightenment. It's illegal in the U.S. unless you're a member of a church that's gotten special permission from the government. You know, ayahuasca that developed over probably thousands of years because it's so complex. In many ways, maybe it was one of the first pharmaceutical drugs because you actually had to make it. Yeah, yeah. had to make it. You didn't just pluck it or pick it. You have to collect the vines right. and the plants very carefully, brew them up, boil it down into a, a thick liquid concoction that then you can drink. Yeah. And then what would happen and, to me if I did that? Well, first of all, you'd probably do it in a, in a small group with uh, an expert shaman or ritual practitioner uh, leading, the, leading the ceremony. And more than likely, you're going to puke your brains out, uh, possibly for a couple hours. What? Yes. You're going to purge. Wow. Right. And then you have one of the most powerful visionary experiences you can have with any plant in the world. So kind of crazy hallucinations or what? No, these aren't hallucinations. This is just a heightened perception of reality. It's not a hallucination. It's not something that's, you know, that's fabricated, that's unreal. It is real. It is reality. You're just perceiving in a, in a broader spectrum. So it's not different than reality. It's part of reality. It's part of reality. It's almost a heightened uh, sensation or heightened perception of reality. You're able to commune with, you know, the jaguar spirits of the forest, but it's, it's, it's real. Is ayahuasca really a gateway to a heightened reality? Or is your mind just playing tricks on you? The brain obviously is incredibly complicated. It utilizes all these different chemical messengers and different neurochemical systems. It's clear that these substances act on the serotonin system, which has profound effects on many different areas of the brain. It's likely that this loosens up the standard associations of our thoughts and loosens up how we're viewing the world. Before we leave Copan, I want Alan to show me the famous ball courts where the Maya played a high stakes game. And the losers? Let's just say you didn't want to be one of the losers. So did they use drugs as part of this ball game? Well, we don't know for sure, Yeah. right? But up in the highlands of Guatemala, there's hundreds of years of stone mushroom sculptures. And some of these sculptures are associated with ball game implements and, and paraphernalia that uh, suggests, yeah, in fact, they might have eaten the mushrooms and played the ball game. Now, why in the world would, would someone use magic mushrooms before playing this game? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's some pretty good evidence that uh, psilocybin, the active ingredient in the magic mushrooms, enhances visual acuity yeah. and also physical coordination. Wow. So long before Major League Baseball, this was the first performance-enhancing drug. You know what it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do you play it? First of all, you can't use your hands. Ah, okay. okay. You can only use your chest. You could use your shoulders, your upper arms, uh, your thighs, your hips. And that's how you had to keep the ball in play. And you had to keep the ball in the air because this is not just sport, this is ritual. Okay? And the ball is the sun. You got to keep the sun in the sky. Right. And if it drops on the ground, it's bouncing on the ceiling of the underworld. You're going to disturb the lords of the underworld. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Yeah. The losers uh, might have been the ones sacrificed. So there was a consequence for not playing well. A big consequence. So you're talking about a game of life or death. You're going you're gonna to eat some mushrooms, and you're going to try to keep that ball from hitting the ground without using your hands. That's right, or you die. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a great idea. You guys were hardcore. I mean, it's like the, like the Oakland Raiders of the 70s, you know? Bad. Let's play. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go. OK. OK. 
Oh, you did! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> were there referees? Uh, probably. And there were probably spectators everywhere. Yeah. Wow, this yeah. is embarrassing. Sorry, my fans, my fans. Sorry. Let's try it again. Let's keep Let's do it. We got to get it back and forth twice. Okay. We're better now. Ah! Okay, I gotta, I'll use my thigh. Let's do it one more time. Okay. Serve match. Uh, oh, whoa, I cheated, cheated. I cheated. Okay. Sudden death, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Serve it up, big guy. Uh, 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 Looks like it's time to go sacrifice. Come on, let's go. To the Maya and other indigenous cultures around them, drugs were a gateway to the spirit realm. These days, we put psychedelic drugs in the most highly restricted drug classification. But for the indigenous cultures in the Americas, hallucinogenic drugs like mushrooms and ayahuasca have always been sacred tools to help us connect. What about the ancient society that gave us democracy? Did they feel the same way? Did the ancient Greeks believe drugs were deadly poisons or precious medicine? After all, don't many of our beliefs today come from the classical world? Many of our modern philosophical views are based upon Greek models. And these Greek models are developed at a time when the early Greek philosophers are using drugs, and they're using drugs extensively. We've come to understand that what they called philosopher might now call a shaman. I've heard about the existence of mystery cults in ancient Greece, where participants took part in a secret religious ritual. We know very little about it, but it seems altered states were definitely involved. I have to see for myself. This is the sanctuary of the goddesses Demeter and Persephone, and people came here from Athens every year to be initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries. You had an out-of-body experience in which you journeyed together to the other world and came back again. If the initiates journeyed to another world, what exactly took them there? Well, there have been two theories. Some people have said magic mushrooms. Others have said ergot. Right, so I know, I've heard of magic mushrooms. What is ergot? And what drugs were the ancient Greeks using? Let's find out by continuing our journey through the Stone Ages. If the ancient Maya were using drugs to connect with the gods, did the ancient Greeks have the same agenda? What were they hoping to discover through the secret ritual of the Eleusinian mysteries? And what exactly fueled that discovery? The Eleusinian mystery was a major religious experience in classical antiquity. It lasted for 2,000 years. This is a Celestarian. This is where it all happened. It's huge. It's uh, almost like Madison Square Gardens for the Greeks or something. It would have held thousands of people. See the steps around the edge? Yeah. Then people would have been standing up there. You've got the, the light, the dark, the music. Dancing. The dark, the dancing. Yeah. Yep. So it's almost as, it's like it's a, a, a giant Greek rave, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It yeah. is. That's, that's a pretty good description. It's complete sensory overload, and your life is changed forever. But this wasn't just kids with glow sticks in the forest. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were each initiated into the mystery at Eleusis. There must have been something going on that rocked their world. They met the gods. They met the gods. Wow. So they came here and they did this ritual. Given that nature, do you think that, uh, that there were drugs involved or no? Drugs might have been involved here. No kidding. Uh, you're certainly talking about altered states. Right. If drugs were involved in these altered states, what types would they have been? Well, there have been two theories. Some people have said magic mushrooms. Others have said ergot. Right, so I know, I've heard of magic mushrooms. What is ergot? Ergot is a grain fungus that grows on rock. When ingested, it radically alters brain chemistry by increasing serotonin levels, inducing massive hallucinations. In the 1930s, it was used to synthesize lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD. We do know that there was a drink uh, that, that the initiates drank called kikaon which is made of barley and penny royal, which is kind of mint. Uh -huh. um, and they would drink that. So if it was barley and there had been fungus on there, there it possibly could have been ergot. That's, that's the theory. Looks like the ergot would have given them a, uh, the ability to envision the goddess because it has psychotropic effects in the body. The main problem with this is that no one's been able to 
um, extract from ergot uh, a drug that's hallucinogenic that doesn't kill you and paralyze you first. Wow. Ergot can be very dangerous, yes, definitely. And that, that's why the Athenians probably didn't want this formula getting out to the public. The substance was interesting enough so that it was misused for recreational purposes. And this was a capital offense. So the participants may have been taking a drug so secret that revealing it would get them killed. Some historians believe that same drug inspired the classical masterpieces we still read in universities today. Anybody who is anyone in antiquity who's a philosopher ultimately is initiated in the Eleusinian mysteries. And these psychotropic experiences, they enabled them to come up with the inspired thoughts that they came up with. So when did this all end? Around about AD 400, this place was sacked by the Goths. Goths? You mean like kids with black eyeliner and skinny black pants? These ones wore armor. Ah, <laughs> they're a little more formidable. Uh, a little more, yes, yeah. yes. The other thing that mysteries ended when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity. And the sanctuary is in ruins because the Christians desecrated it. I wonder if the Greeks used drugs for any other purposes. Drugs were used to a wide extent in the Greek world. Even in the Greek assembly, they're equivalent of a congress. Yep, there's the Parthenon. This is where the world's first democracy was born. Amazing, right here. Right here, where we're standing. And the meetings would start with purification ritual, with the burning of incense, uh, botanical substances. The assembly members were subjected to a fumigation of psychotropic botanicals in order to induce what they called a jovial spirit so that they could then discuss politics. What was incense back then? We know they burnt frankincense and myrrh, plant resins, maybe plant leaves. Perhaps cannabis? It's not impossible. Yeah. The Greeks knew about cannabis. Well, let me give you a little hint, OK? Where there's incense, there's cannabis. <laughs> Fumigation is very much like hot boxing. So with hot boxing, you can sit in a car with uh, your buddies and smoke uh, marijuana, and you get the effects of the marijuana uh, continuously. Imagine filling the car with so much smoke that you were gasping. So it's the equivalent of taking our Congress and forcing them to uh, inhale psychotropic drugs before they actually met to discuss legislation. It seems like an elevated state was an important part of both religious uh, ceremonies, political ceremonies. It was an important part of Greek life. Well, that, that's true. Yeah. Um, intoxication was something that they thought important. There's a Greek word, pharmakon, which they used to mean medicine or poison. It's, it's where we get the modern word pharmacology from. The Greek physician Hippocrates, considered the father of modern medicine, recognized there might be a scientific reason that drugs affect our bodies in certain ways. The Greeks said any substance that you could put in your body that would affect the change could be potentially both bad or good. Snake venom is one of the most commonly used drugs in antiquity. The modern medical symbol, which we inherited from the ancient Greeks, is two snakes wrapped around a staff. This may be an indication they realized that like snake venom, many drugs possess the power to heal and to harm. So it, it seems like there, in the Greek society, there wasn't this moral stigma against drug use. No, absolutely not. It wasn't really a moral issue at all. They didn't think of it in those terms. And they appreciated pleasure, and that was a central part of their understanding of how you should live the good life. So for the Greeks, drugs were all about pleasure. They were, about yeah. pleasure on the right occasions, in the right contexts. Much like the Greek system in college today. I'll believe you. <laughs> From religious rituals, to political offerings, to medical study, the Greeks had a sophisticated relationship with drugs. They understood that drug use could be dangerous. But using drugs was not yet a question of right and wrong. Is it possible Jesus and drugs have been battling it out for people's faith and devotion for over 2,000 years? For the ancient Greeks and other pagan religions, drugs were a key part of the process of connecting with the gods. So why did the early Christians feel differently? Early Christians uh, expressed a great deal of anxiety uh, and even suspicion about the pleasures of the body. 
Even back then, people knew that drugs could induce pleasures of the body, and that was not in sync with the Christian message. Faith in Christ is the only road to salvation. So faith in drugs became a problem. By the fourth century, with the rise of Christian emperors, the first anti-drug laws are introduced to society. And these anti-drug laws focus upon the use of drugs by these competing mystery religions. So if people are taking psychedelics and, and having the experience of union with God, what do they need the church for? The early Christians wanted people to see that faith in Christ was the only way to induce an authentic religious experience. And some historians believe the early Christians fought an actual war against drugs. The Christians become gangs of roving law enforcement agents. And these monks end up tearing down temples and murdering people. The following program explores drug use and abuse throughout history. Viewer discretion is advised. Did Christianity feel threatened by drugs? Does faith in a substance somehow conflict with faith in Jesus? If pre-Christian religions use drugs to experience God, Christianity seems to think drugs will do just the opposite. So why this divide? I'm hoping the Calvary Addiction Center in Phoenix will have some answers for me. For people who want a Christian element to their treatment, they have a place where they can come and not have to sidestep the issues and come and really have their faith in God be part of their treatment. Can people only beat drug addiction if they believe in a higher power? In a recent study, alcoholics in faith-based rehab programs were 30% more likely to remain sober than those in secular rehab. Americans of faith also live longer, are generally wealthier, and are more likely to recover from life-threatening surgery. A little faith goes a long way, and I guess rehab is no exception. What made Christians decide to oppose drugs in the first place? Did they see drugs as a competitor from the beginning? Some historians believe the early Christians fought an actual war against drugs. The Christians were very antagonistic to any competitors with their growing religion, and so they persecuted them. They destroyed their sanctuaries, desecrated their sculptures. By the fourth century, groups of monks who are bursting into estates where it's known that the local inhabitants are using drugs in religious ceremonies, and these monks end up tearing down temples and murdering people. The attack on the use of drugs by non-Christians was the central plank in the political platform that the bishops were using to gain power and legitimacy. At Calvary, the people aren't fighting a war on drugs. They're fighting addiction. And their biggest weapon is faith. But why can't drugs and faith coexist? There's no communication with God through, through the means of, of, a, of a substance. The only way the Bible speaks to get reconciled to God and have communication with Him, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What about, like, uh, for instance, uh, Native American tribes? Uh, who actually use drugs to, f in, at least in their terms, find God. A lot of times what people have done in history is they've even used um, mind-altering substances, which the Bible would refer to as, in some translations, witchcraft, some translations, sorcery. Here's the Christian perspective. Yeah. This is it, in a nutshell. Right. You don't have so much of a drug and alcohol problem right. as you do a worship problem. We switch God for an idol. And, and here's the thing, Dean. With the idol is sometimes alcohol or drugs, yeah. is what you're saying. And Dean, when I pass by a liquor aisle in a yeah. store, what do I see? A sanctuary with idols. Alcohol is the result of grain and yeast interacting with sugars in a process called fermentation. It's the most popular drug in the world. And today, about 140 million people suffer from alcohol-related disorders. So are there any biblical figures who speak about drug abuse specifically? One of the best you can go to would be uh, the Apostle Paul, who dedicated his whole life to Christ, wrote much of the New Testament. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, here's some, he says, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, sorcery, idolatry, false gods never satisfy real spiritual needs. You can chase that all you want. You will always come back broken, shattered, and, 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 and crawling. So from a Christian perspective, drugs were always false gods that distracted people from the real God they're supposed to be worshiping. 
But what compelled the first Christians to decide using substances was somehow anti-Christian? What's wrong with allowing the body a little pleasure every now and then? After all, Jesus drank wine. It wouldn't be inappropriate to use the term puritanical uh, in association with some of the early Christian views. This sense of self-denial was an important part of at least an idealized early Christian spirituality. And one thing you see emerging from this period is, for the first time in history, a view of drugs as an immoral activity. All morality aside, drugs pale in comparison to what Christians believe is the ultimate high. At some level, you can, you can feel that ecstasy feeling or the, the, the feeling you try to get when you take drugs in church or within, in Christ. Absolutely, no question, and it's real, Dean. It's for real. So Christianity has stood firmly opposed to drugs since the beginning. But Judaism has a different take. While there is some anxiety expressed in rabbinic texts, there was a celebration of the possibility of physical pleasure, whether it be sex uh, or intoxication, in moderation. Uh, everything in its proper place in moderation, uh, but all an important part of the way we live this life in this body, in this world. Other religions are a little less open-minded to drug use. Mormons believe the body is sacred, which means no alcohol, tobacco, illicit drugs, or even caffeine. Yes, that means no coffee. Scientologists think drugs impede the mind's ability to heal itself and can cause serious mental anguish. For Rastafarians, it's all about marijuana, which they consider a holy herb used to commune with God. On the other hand, they generally don't tolerate alcohol and think the wine written about in the Bible was actually just grape juice. But it was Christianity that emerged as the dominant value system in the West. This could be where our view towards drugs came from. After the fourth and fifth centuries, drugs take on this moral stigma and they're bad. Drugs become something bad. But if Christianity was so powerful, why didn't drug use stop altogether under the church? Well, it seemed when people realized the incredible value of local drugs in a global economy, morality took a back seat. Sometimes, no matter how religious people are, money talks louder. When the European powers begin exploring the high seas in the early 15th century, the discovery of new worlds meant the discovery of new worlds full of drugs. The drugs began as local products. Uh, the reason for that is simply that most drugs come from plants, and plants were not evenly spread around the world. It's largely as a result of the growth of global oceanic trade that, that you have this confluence of the world's drug products in the early modern world. I know Asia, Africa, and the Americas had native plants and weeds that Europeans had never dreamed of. But just what drugs did their explorers bring back from their exotic travels across the oceans? So this is Captain Robert Knox of the East India Company, and there's a really fascinating story behind this painting. Knox ended up getting shipwrecked on Sri Lanka yeah. um, and spent 19 years in Sri Lanka because the local king there wanted to keep him as part of his zoo menagerie. What? He was in a zoo exhibit? Yeah, he wow. was sort of a, the, the token Englishman. Um, <laughs> Knox eventually ended up back in London and goes to the Royal Society to present to the king the stuff that he's brought back. And one of the things that he brings back is, is cannabis. Cannabis? So, yeah, very much. Literally kneeling and saying, yeah. your lord, cannabis. We think this is the first time that uh, cannabis is brought back to, back to Britain, because after Knox comes back and presents his samples, you get all sorts of experiments and discussions about this new substance and what it might do, yeah. do for us. So what other drugs made it back to England from all this world exploration? Well, Knox, as we've heard, is bringing back stuff from Asia. But of course, in the New World, from the Americas, it's tobacco that's the big drug. Europeans, when they discovered tobacco, also discovered a new means for consuming a drug, that is, smoking. And that would become very important, not only for tobacco, but for the consumption of other drugs later on. So the fastest way to get the highest concentration of drug into your brain is either by injecting it into a vein or smoking it. 
Prior to the early 17th century, smoking as a means of administering drugs, at least in Europe, was uncommon. People discovered all these new drugs, they entered world commerce, people discovered new ways of administering these drugs, and that's letting the psychoactive genie out of the bottle. Once drugs hit the global markets, global marketing would follow. So before there was Coke or, or, or Pepsi, the first global brand was Patna Opium. Yeah, you knew if you bought Patna Opium, you were getting good, good stuff. Yeah. Which drugs traveled the high seas and spread across the globe? Let's continue our journey through the Stone Ages at the place where time begins. You're standing on the prime meridian of the world, and everything to the west is in one hemisphere, and everything to the east is in the other hemisphere. So London, essentially, is at the centre of the world. Yeah. So the British said this is the centre of the world and it happened to be in the middle of London. It's not just arbitrary. They picked it because they could. And one of the things that uh, brought the prime meridian, I suppose, to this place is um, the commercial trade of the East India Company. Tea, spices, but also opium. That's a major part of the story of the British Empire and the East India Company. Opium works by flooding the brain with narcotic alkaloids, creating intense pleasure and a release from pain. It's been widely used for thousands of years and is probably the world's oldest medicine for diarrhea. One of the major sort of ways the East India Company paid for the tea trade was by shipping opium to China. Wow. It's Patna opium that they started developing and encouraging um, and trying to sell into China, and they sort of see this as a sort of the first worldwide global brand. So before there was Coke or, or, or Pepsi, the first global brand was Patna opium. Yeah, you knew if you bought Patna opium, you were getting good, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, smoke Patna opium. Right. So England wanted tea from China, but the Chinese only wanted silver or opium. And England, of course, had no opium. That's where India comes in. Like all smart businesses, England outsourced their opium manufacturing to India, then sold the opium to China for tea. And the strategy worked, at least for a while. The Chinese certainly weren't happy about it. The Chinese emperor, who was the most powerful individual in the world at the time, decided, well, I've had enough. I'm going to stamp out this drug trade. I'm going to stop the opium trade. He eventually destroys a huge amount of British opium that's be about to be sold into China. It's really the spark that started the first Anglo-Chinese war, um, and the Times a London newspaper called it the Opium War. So it's kind of interesting that the Chinese started their war with, with the Brits by destroying a bunch of opium, and the Americans started our war with the Brits by destroying a bunch of tea at the Boston Tea Party. Yeah, well, that's the problem of being a commercial empire, I suppose. Yeah. When the first Opium War broke out in 1839, the British were importing about six million pounds of opium a year. And as a result of the first Opium War, uh, the Chinese were forced to partially legalize the trade. And then as a result of a second conflict, they ultimately had to completely legalize the trade. By the year 1879, the British were importing something like 15 million pounds a year. So did opium uh, ever get back to, to England? In the later 19th century, early 20th century, it starts to become a, a bigger problem. In the last half of the 19th century, people, especially reformers, are starting to wake up to the fact that the world has a drug problem. Even though the money was still very good, these were indeed very lucrative enterprises, what about the drunkards? What about the asylums? What about the opium addicts? What about the public costs of accidents? What about the hospital admissions? People and governments who manufactured drugs were making big money as drug use spread across the globe. Soon enough, drugs started to affect the way people thought about the world. Just ask the artist. I'm willing to bet they were getting high off this global supply. But to find out for sure, I'm taking a trip to the home of an all-time great, William Shakespeare. Where did the Bard's inspiration come from? So we're here at Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, uh, Shakespeare's birthplace, right? Is there any evidence that Shakespeare himself used drugs? Well, it's really hard to say. There have been archaeological digs that have found pipes with trace elements of cannabis and cocaine um, from properties that he owned. So I'd say that's a yes. <laughs> but not quite, <laughs> because these pipes date from roughly the same century as when Shakespeare was alive. Whether or not he actually owned them, whether or not anyone he even knew owned them is hard to say. So then which plays of Shakespeare speak to his uh, attitude towards drugs? A lot of people would say that his trippiest play is probably A Midsummer Night's Dream. And actually, the Royal Shakespeare Company, which is based here in Stratford, is doing that play. So you might want to go check it out. I think I will. 
Midsummer Night's Dream. It, it, it's, it seems like it's one of Shakespeare's most trippy plays, wouldn't you, would you say? It just feels like it's just, you know, the first Shakespeare play that kind of, you know, shows you a drug being used right. and, you know, shows you the effects. Yeah. And you think Shakespeare may or may not have used drugs when he was writing? He came from Stratford and would have had a working knowledge of sort of herbs and plants, you know, uppers and downers right, right. around here. Right, right. So it's, I think, I think, I, I would say definitely. Yeah. You only have to look at Sonnet 76. Yeah. Where, you know, the kind of... It's my favourite sonnet. No, yeah, exactly. The noted weed. Yeah. Compound strange. Yeah. You know, don't be telling me those are like, you know, ways of writing. Surely. And also, you know, we talk about Shakespeare's lost years. I mean, what was he doing then? Yeah. <laughs> The list of drug-using artists is long and distinguished. We all know Vincent van Gogh had a taste for absinthe, but so did Oscar Wilde, Edgar Allan Poe, and Pablo Picasso. Of course, Picasso also enjoyed his opium, as did Charles Dickens and Mary Shelley. Allen Ginsberg wrote Howl on peyote, a habit he shared with Jim Morrison and Hunter S. Thompson. Ray Charles and James Taylor were heroin addicts, and Johnny Cash walked the line between barbiturates and amphetamines. Adolf Hitler was no artist, but it's worth noting that daily methamphetamine shots in the butt and cocaine eye drops helped him get through the day. And marijuana? Uh, do we even need a list? After somebody has smoked a joint, your brain is making connections it doesn't normally make. And that's sort of the definition of create creativity, is associating one event, one fact, one experience, one emotion with one that you hadn't done before. Of course, many of our most beloved artists have succumbed to drug abuse. Heroin is responsible for the deaths of Janis Joplin and Sid Vicious, while heroin mixed with cocaine, known as a speedball, killed John Belushi, Nick Drake, and River Phoenix. Cocaine took the lives of Ike Turner and John Entwistle of The Who, while cocaine combined with morphine ultimately doomed Chris Farley. Morphine alone got the best of comedian Lenny Bruce, and for Heath Ledger, it was a legal form of heroin, oxycodone, along with about half a dozen other narcotics. Do I need to say more? Without drugs, we could have had these artistic creators and experiences, but not without the experience that often drugs create. It's often a trade-off. You can't get the art without the psychosis. Trade-offs were the name of the game in the age of empire. Drugs fueled new economies and artistic inspiration the world had never seen. No one realized this explosion in drug availability would create real social problems. But much of this was overshadowed in the 19th century by major advances in the use of drugs as medicine. In 1803, German scientist Friedrich Sertner made a major breakthrough in the history of drugs. For the first time, he isolated the active ingredient in a narcotic plant. That plant was the opium poppy, and the active ingredient was morphine. This changed everything. In 1803, the compound morphine was isolated from the opium plant, and that was like the birth of this science of pharmacology. Morphine is a wonderful drug for acute pain. So if people have a heart attack or break a leg, um, uh, it's almost instant relief. It was mankind's cleverness that both gave us these very valuable, clinically useful drugs, but also created the addictive liability of those substances. With more potent narcotics coming out of labs each passing decade, would we ever stop and wonder what these drugs might do to us? This is drops for babies, and it contains alcohol and opium. Do the most dangerous drugs start out as medicines? And was morphine a revolutionary pain reliever? Or was it poised to ensnare a new generation of addicts? In the wake of the morphine breakthrough, drugs manufactured in a laboratory began to boom in the 19th century some pretty strange drugs started hitting the market, and it became open season for your friendly neighborhood druggist. Hey, how you doing? I'm Dean. Hey, Dr. Jeremy Green. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, so what is this place? It's a community pharmacy as reconstructed here in uh, Mystic Seaport, Connecticut. Wow. 
And we have a selection of drugs here that are, we really need to be called patent medicines, right? Patent medicines are very popular in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and there are all these stories of patent medicine hucksters. Right. Now when you say patent medicine, what is, what is patent medicine? What it meant more is that they had a right to keep their contents of their drugs a secret. They could make incredible claims. They would back them up with testimonials of hundreds and hundreds of men and women and children that all were cured from the most terrible afflictions by a drop of these compounds. Medicine itself was uh, rather limited in the 19th century, what it could and could, could not do for certain diseases. The patent medicine industry doesn't always know what they're doing doesn't always know that their products are working, but they want the customer to feel that the product is working. These products are the most profitable products. They're the ones that are mostly available. And they're also widely used, not just by the general public, but by physicians as well. So Jeremy, let's take a look at some of these bottles, huh? See, what, see what's in them. Look, look at this one. Stuff. This is uh, elixir of opium. And so you begin to think of what kinds of things would you put into a drug if you're trying to sell a medicine. And these are things like, you know, opium, morphine. You may have less actual interest in making people better, but you definitely want to sell your product. And that's the great thing about selling cocaine powder as a hay fever remedy. If you sell that powder to somebody, they're going to know it's working. They're going to feel it. They're going to have a reaction. And that's all that the patent medicine companies want. How did it make them feel? Well, I mean, it, it, many of these medicines make them feel very, very good. And the more you felt, yeah. uh, the stronger the medicine was, the more powerful it was, the more you believed in it, the more likely you were to recommend it to your friends right. and family to use. So this, by this standard, these drugs really worked. Yeah. Uh, but they certainly also worked to cause a great deal of harm as well. At the time of the patent medicines, uh, the things were highly unregulated. And as a result, uh, people not only became addicted, but other people died. Uh, as a result of some of these concoctions. And I like this one here. This is Nervine and Invigorator. Okay? Yes. And it's, it's for the cure, permanent cure, of all nervous diseases. Yes. There are an impressive <laughs> amount of claims that this one makes, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So it's highly concentrated, yeah. especially adapted to the relief and permanent cure of all nervous diseases. Yeah. Headache, neuralgia, dyspepsia, biliousness, diarrhea, constipation, colds, coughs, fevers, ache, liver complaints, consumption, loss of appetite, female weakness, mm. fainting fits, palpitations, spasms, dizziness, whooping cough, measles, et cetera, et cetera. It actually says et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. at the end of it. <laughs> You could definitely say the patent medicine industry is a wild west of medicine. Sometimes even literally, they would uh, chalk, a, chalk something full of morphine and advertise it as a morphine addiction cure. And they litter the landscape with advertisements. Carter Products, uh, they would uh, paint boulders on the side of the road, a precursor to billboards. They really did create a kind of a carnival atmosphere. In many ways, the birth of advertising in America can be traced to the patent medicine industry. Throughout this period, the rapidly growing drug industry was constantly looking for the next big seller. This search turned up one potent drug that would go on to take an infamous place in history. Drug companies identify cocaine as potentially a huge new product for the market. And they're the ones who are really responsible for transforming it into a commercial substance. Doctors quickly jumped on the cocaine bandwagon. They began using it as an anesthetic in throat and eye surgery and endorsing the popular cure-alls and miracle elixirs that were widely available at the time. There's wonderful stories from the 1880s about doctors who have a patient who's depressed or a woman who hasn't spoken in months and who's given cocaine and begins talking. That's revolutionary. With cocaine, the patent medicine marketing machine was in full effect. Manufacturers of cocaine products made every effort to make sure that the customer knew that the cocaine was in the product. That was the whole point. And of course, cocaine was the key ingredient in a popular new tonic. As the slogan goes, Coke is it. In Atlanta in the 1890s, if you wanted to order a Coca-Cola at the drugstore, for example, you might ask them to give me a dope. Cocaine had arrived in a big way, and people were discovering all sorts of new uses for it. 
you begin to see in the 1880s and 1890s in America, employers all over America deciding that what they ought to do is to make sure that employees have access to cocaine. By the late 19th century, powerful drugs were everywhere in society, and no one was insulated from their effects. I mean, look at this one. This is, this is drops for babies, and it contains alcohol and opium. <laughs> I mean, and, and it cures, right? It's a remedy for the relief of wind, cramp, and colic. A lot of what we now have is regulatory structures to prevent kind of casual selling of, of, of narcotics yeah. um, comes out of the fact that kids were being given this kind of stuff to yeah. sleep. Although I gotta say, I'd like a remedy for my kid's wind, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Drug makers were pushing all these drugs out to the public with very little knowledge of their long-term effects. So of course people used drugs. There was no one telling them not to. They didn't do any longitudinal studies to determine, whoops, uh, yeah, it works well in the first month, but after that, it just kept bringing customers back. Y'all come on back, if you will, and they would. In 1898, the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company introduced heroin as a cough suppressant and a safe, non-addictive substitute for morphine. But like cocaine and morphine, heroin can take hold of a person's body and never let go. As you use these drugs, your body becomes dependent physiologically. That is, um, you know, your breathing center and your brain is adapting to its presence. So if you suddenly stopped uh, the drug, uh, you notice it and it's unpleasant. Well into the 19th century, dependence on drugs was seen as a human weakness of will. It wasn't until the 1880s when addiction began to be attributed to the drug and not just the user. If you look at most cases of, of people who became opiate addicts, they do not start out of dissipation. These are not women who are visiting opium dens or something like that. These are women who are going to their physicians. As drugs became a bigger social problem, people wanted to point a finger. The racism of the day came out as different drugs became associated with different races. Outside observers see that black people are using cocaine. And the same thing that made it attractive to employers, that it could potentially make them stronger, powerful, increase their endurance and their capacity, it could also be frightening to people. It's a lot like what happens around alcohol at the same time. You see these temperance unions getting set up, being worried that a thing, a substance, you know, something like morphine, something like opium, is such a toxic agent in society yeah. that it needs to be restricted for the good of all of society. As we entered the 20th century, our attitude towards drug use began to shift we began to see drugs for what they were, a problem that had to be dealt with. The question is, just what would we do about it? By 1900, we begin to think about a new way of responding to drugs, by using law. Hoping to protect people from the dangers that come with unregulated drug access, the government formed the Food and Drug Administration in 1906, forcing drug makers to label their products if they contained a dangerous narcotic substance. They stepped it up a notch in 1914 by outlawing the recreational use of narcotics altogether, which meant that doctors became the only source of supply. When the federal government cracks down on the physician, you need to get a new source of supply, then it's really the birth of smuggling networks. When uh, cocaine and heroin get criminalized, of course, a black market develops for people who are using those drugs for uh, a wide variety of reasons. The percentage of the addicts who have um, criminal or underworld backgrounds proportionately increases. Chinese opium smoker, a young tough on the street corner snorting heroin, um, a black man going on a cocaine spree. This is a very different kind of problem, or at least it's perceived as a different problem. Many substances that were formerly considered medicines were now illegal drugs. But doctors still had to do their job. The question was, what drugs could they use to do it? There's an opening for new drugs to take the place of lost sedatives, painkillers, and stimulants. The FDA had to determine which drugs were safe and which were not. 
1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act put in place the stipulation that the FDA had to approve drugs before they hit the market. We're in the hot seat a lot, and a lot of the job is science. A lot of the job is judgment, and people can disagree on all of that. The government ultimately had to let alcohol and tobacco slip by because those drugs were so culturally ingrained. We all know what happened when they tried to ban alcohol during Prohibition. With alcohol, we said, it's not working, let's stop. But with drugs, the decision that we made is, it's not working, let's get tougher. A war on drugs was on the horizon, and someone was going to have to fight it. In a year's time, we'll probably run close to 2 million pounds through this place. 2 million pounds? Yeah. What do you end up doing with all this, all this marijuana? Take it to an incinerator and burn it up. Well, you burn all this stuff? We, we burn it all. That's a lot of burning weed. When did our government decide to regulate drugs? Why are some drugs legal and others not? And who's calling the shots anyways? Even as FDA regulation got tougher in the next few decades, one surprising drug that's now totally illegal was merely classified as experimental. In 1938, a Swiss scientist working for a large pharmaceutical company created a drug that would prove to be the strongest, most concentrated mind-altering substance the world had ever seen, lysergic acid 25, LSD. I would say LSD is potentially the greatest transforming experience, or it can be the most catastrophic nightmarish experience that will make life intolerable where suicide is the only option. LSD floods the brain with a hallucinogenic compound causing massive shifts in consciousness. It's so potent that two gallons would be enough to take the entire US population on an acid trip. It had been used in therapy before. When I was in medical school, one of my classmates was receiving LSD as part of his therapy in 1959. LSD was successfully used in controlled environments throughout the 40s and 50s to treat people with schizophrenia and alcoholism. Drugs usually start their careers as medicines, and they don't generally become controversial in the larger society until they escape the realm of medicine and enter the realm of the street when people begin using them for recreational purposes. The seeds of our modern relationship with drugs have been planted. By the mid-20th century, we had a booming pharmaceutical industry, a government body to regulate it, and a black market thriving off the drugs deemed too dangerous for the legal system. We also had a new drug that would revolutionize the way people think. Now all we needed was a revolution. Drugs would help usher in massive social changes in the 1960s. LSD had escaped the research lab, and a psychologist at Harvard, Timothy Leary, was one of the people who let it out. LSD is the most powerful substance that uh, the human being has ever developed for uh, influencing mind. I've used the comparison of nuclear energy or fissional material. I think that uh, in the right hands, and, uh, it will bring about changes. Tim would say, everyone should smoke marijuana every day and take LSD once a week turn on, tune in, drop out. There are actually people who dropped out of college because of what he said. I was 19 years old when I decided to take what, in effect, perhaps, is the largest dose of LSD ever taken to this day, 100,000 micrograms, and uh, had one day of ecstasy and rapture, seven days of spiritual, catastrophic, nightmarish agony. Psychedelics can put you right into the center of yourself to the point where you can start reprogramming yourself. LSD was as polarizing as the decade that made it infamous. By the late 60s, the US government was facing a losing war in Vietnam and a younger generation they didn't understand. Young people were choosing sex, drugs, and rock and roll instead of a government they didn't feel they could trust. Richard Nixon called Tim Leary, the most dangerous man in America. 
Nixon regarded drug use as a sign of social rot, and personally, he was very alarmed by this increase in drug use. He's concerned about the drug counterculture. He's worried about heroin use among servicemen in Vietnam. Young, middle-class people were using drugs like never before. He's got all of these drug problems that seem to be converging on him and his administration. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. Nixon makes the decision to double down and to create new legal frameworks that will restrict access to drugs even further. In 1970, a series of new drug laws were enacted, and under the direction of Richard Nixon, the Drug Enforcement Agency was formed to step up the effort to get illegal drugs off the streets. But if these drugs were taken off the streets, where exactly did they go? So uh, this place is uh, this place is amazing. What, what, uh, what is this place? We're in a secure holding facility in the southwest part of the United States that uh, is used by the DEA to store large quantities of uh, illicit drugs before they're destroyed, in this case, yeah. mostly marijuana. What would you say, how many pounds are, are in here right now? Uh, right now, we've probably got a couple hundred thousand. A couple hundred thousand pounds. A couple hundred pounds. thousand pounds. And then uh, uh, in a year's time, we'll probably run close to two million pounds through this place. Two million pounds? Yeah. Now, I'm not a mathematician. Can you tell me what that equals wholesale? <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of weed. That's that's a lot. <laughs> what do you end up doing with all this, all this marijuana? This stuff here, what we'll do is we'll take a sample of it. We'll yeah. document it, because a lot of it will be used in evidence in court later on. Right. And then we have a, a pretty consistent burning operation here. We'll take it to an incinerator and burn it up. Well, you burn all this stuff? We, we burn it all. So that's a lot of burning weed. Yeah. Man. So as we all know, drugs were a big part of the 60s. Do you think the DA was created in some part in response to that? I, I think certainly. Yeah. I think that the, the issue that was going on at that time, it was a, a, a significant drug culture. And I think that the, uh, the government at that time wanted to consolidate resources to try to, to, try to do something about that problem. What is, let's say, the mission statement of the DEA? Essentially, the DEA's primary mission is to enforce the Controlled Substances Act. That's the federal drug laws of the United States government. With the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, you have a series of schedules which run from one through five. And the Schedule I drugs are the ones that are absolutely prohibited. When we think that a drug has a high potential for abuse, we then notify the Drug Enforcement Agency that will assign it a schedule. The FDA rates dangerous drugs in five schedules. Schedule I drugs are the most addictive and have the least medicinal value. Schedule II drugs are a bit less addictive with more medicinal value, and so on down the line until you get to Schedule V. Makes perfect sense. But marijuana, including medicinal marijuana, is a Schedule I drug, while drugs like cocaine, PCP, Oxycontin, and morphine are Schedule II. Alcohol and tobacco don't even crack the list. Marijuana is in Schedule I now. It has nothing to do with medicine or science. It has only to do with the politics and the budget of the DEA. In the 70s, we did a lot of uh, um, uh, inner city work, street level work on uh, what was the, drug at, that the drug at that point, a lot of LSD, a lot of heroin, okay. a lot of marijuana. Okay. Um, in the 80s, we moved into a, uh, um, the crack cocaine ep epidemic in the late right. 80s, a lot of violence associated with that. We had to form task forces to combat that violence. And in the 1980s, the drug laws again got tougher, with prison sentences for drug offenders getting longer. Under Reagan rule, the drug war was in full force. Say yes to your life. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. During the 1980s, I was the principal attorney for the House of Representatives involved in the drafting of the federal drug laws. I was deeply disturbed by what happened. I, I was aware that the laws that we were passing were utterly ineffective, that were enriching the cartels that we thought we were fighting. Overdoses were increasing, the prisons were growing, and I saw all this. As we come into the 90s, we, we started seeing the, the rise in uh, methamphetamine, and methamphetamine became a drug of choice, so we had to ramp up our efforts against that. We also had to ramp up our efforts in training local law enforcement officers how to deal with those methamphetamine labs. And in the last decade, we've seen a uh, resurgence or a, 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 an increase in the amount of prescription drugs that are abused by people, opium-based drugs uh, as painkillers and things like that. Right. And along with that has come a rise in heroin because the two drugs are, are intermingled. Right. And then obviously, uh, marijuana has always been a constant for us. I mean, as you can see, we uh, Obviously, I can <laughs> face see a that. constant yeah. battle with the marijuana. Yeah, I can certainly smell it. Yeah. <laughs> as you walk around a DEA drug holding facility, you ask yourself, why is this so valuable? It's because it's illegal. 
And the iron law of economics is when an activity becomes more valuable, more people do it. It's ah. used just like a backpack. Wow, all right. So imagine walking miles and miles yeah. across the terrain. Ooh. Yeah. The border is this magic line. On that side of the border, it's worth $1,000. On this side of the border, it's worth $10,000. That's magic. That's alchemy. And how much total money, in terms of all drugs total collected, do you think the DEA collects in a year? Now, we seize in, in cash and assets from drug dealers, oh. we'll seize close to a billion dollars a year. Wow. If you take the, the, the cost of the drugs that we seize, then you're talking uh, you know, probably tens of billions of dollars. Well, where does that money go? Uh, to the general U.S. Treasury Fund. Wow. Yeah. So we don't get it. We don't get it back. It goes into the uh, to the government fund, and it's used for a variety of different sources. Hopefully, parks and things like that. I, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> teachers and things like that. Right, right, right. But there were also many shadow costs to fighting drugs, and keeping drug offenders in prison is one of them. The drug war, as much as anything else, fuels mass incarceration in the United States, and there's just no precedent for it. Many states have found their prison costs have grown faster than any other category of state expenditure, faster than education, faster than Medicaid, faster than health care. It's incredible transformation, really, in the capacity of the state to wage war on its own citizens in the name of controlling drug. So recently, Kofi Annan and Jimmy Carter and other uh, world leaders released a, a study saying that the war on drugs was not winnable. What do you think about that? I think that the, the, the the title war on drugs is a misnomer. It's not a war. It's a criminal action. We're criminal investigators investigating criminals. We're not soldiers, we're policemen. So when people talk about like alcohol being legal as a argument for legalizing marijuana, how do you feel about that? I think we just have to look at the costs to society. Right. Do we not have enough issues with tobacco right. and alcohol right. in our society? Right. The cost that those two legal drugs right. put on American society, the health care costs, yeah. the, the cost Huge. in lives, you know, alcohol and tobacco are bad. Because those are bad for you and they're legal. Right. I mean, but, the, but, but still, we, society, we decided that as a society. That society. Yep. You say that's OK. Yep. If we were taxing illegal drugs like alcohol and tobacco, that would be $45 billion a year in income to state and local and federal government. Is the price worth it? I mean, like, oh, yeah, we're paying this price, but we don't have a drug problem. Hell no. We are paying an enormous price for a policy that's a failure. I look at it like this. Right now, roughly in, the, in America, we have a 7% population that, that uses drugs on a regular basis. We have 22, 23% that, that smoke tobacco or use tobacco on a regular basis. We have in the high 40s that use alcohol. Right. Can we, as Americans, can we afford to have a high 40s percentage of drug abusers? Despite the government's best efforts, we really haven't resolved anything. Today, People are taking more and more drugs for good reasons and for bad. So where do we go from here? These days, you name it, we got it. So how can we decide what drugs to put in our bodies? You know, you don't know everything about the drug when it's first put on the market. So. We don't know everything about the drug. Isn't wow. Still learning. You're giving me anxiety. You guys have any drugs for anxiety? Humans have a long history of using drugs for all sorts of different reasons. And there's all kinds of substances that humans have used as drugs. But the situation has never been as complicated as it is now. Today, people are choosing drugs more than ever before, sometimes as medicines to cure sickness, and other times as a dangerous habit that does harm not only to users, but also to the community around them. So I'm teaming up with a 30-year veteran of the Chicago Narcotics Police to see how illegal drugs are affecting life on the streets. We'll take a ride out south here first. It's always had a uh, consistency for sales on a street level in that, too. What's the big drugs here in the urban in a place like Chicago? Heroin and uh, crack cocaine. Crack cocaine. Crack is a cheaper derivative of powdered cocaine, named from the sound made when it's smoked. When taken in high doses, users may experience delusional parasitosis, the feeling that parasites are crawling under their skin. I would have to say that's a crew right that's there. That's a crew right there, yeah. Every other block or some of the blocks are all controlled by different gangs and stuff like that. I think we're looking right down here. 
There's a guy with a red hat down here that looks like he's, he's selling. Well, he just took it off, but he looks like he's selling. But if you watch, the two guys right here looking out, there'll be signals to each other. At some point, uh, we, we assume they're going to spot our car. It ain't a game to them. When we're out here even doing this, we're impeding on their business. Right. There's undercover officers that get beat off. Just because you're a policeman doesn't mean they, you know, you're, you're they have any respect from you or you're exempt from anything. The U.S. has 4% of the world's population, but consumes 65% of the world's supply of hard drugs. The most popular illegal drug in the U.S. is marijuana, followed by cocaine and then hallucinogens, including ecstasy. It's estimated that 50% of all crimes in the U.S. are drug-related. The cost of illicit drugs to our society is astounding. The substance abuse paradigm, it's over $200 billion. You can attempt to quantify it. While illegal drugs in the U.S. cost society $200 billion a year, the pharmaceutical industry spends $70 billion a year to develop new drugs. Here in Chicago, just a few blocks away from the booming inner city drug trade, the pharmaceutical industry is gathered for the annual meeting of the Drug Information Association, the DIA. The DIA exists to spread neutral information about drugs. All I wanted to know was how we let our relationship with drugs get so complicated. It is mind-boggling. You think about a typical drug yeah. takes 10 years. Whoa, 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 whoa. It costs a billion years? dollars. Whoa, 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 whoa. A 10 years and a billion dollars to for develop. one drug. Yeah, you look at something like a Lipitor or yeah. something, right? Yeah. The development process on that to bring it from first time in humans yeah. to approval by the FDA, Right. 10 years long and cost you a billion dollars. I have an idea for a drug. Yeah? Yeah, it, it, it actually, you take it and it goes to the gym and it runs five miles for you. <laughs> Jogathan. It's yeah. called Jogathan. <laughs> but are all the drugs on the legal market actually safe? Companies must have a pretty clear idea what a drug does before they start selling it, right? Dean, we're a drug safety consulting firm for the pharmaceutical industry, so we help companies evaluating the side effects of drugs. You don't know everything about the drug when it's first put on the market. So. We don't know everything about the drug. Isn't wow. still learning. Now you're giving me anxiety. You, have, you guys have any drugs for anxiety? If you got a pill for that, I'll take it. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> Think my head looks like that? With all these new pharmaceuticals available today, it's physicians who continue to be the gatekeepers of these drugs. Hi, I'm Dean Norris. Uh, can I buy 15? Uh, just please send in here, and Dr. Isaacs will be with you shortly. Great. Thank you. So this year at my annual checkup, I have a few more questions for Dr. Isaacs. Dean, yeah. hi. Hey, Good doctor. Good to see you. Come inside. Good to see you. Come this way. And since I'm over 40, Dr. Isaacs will have a few more fingers for my annual prostate exam. Appetite is good? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. And, and you sleep through the night? Uh, usually. Uh, 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 good lord. Wow, it's impressive. I've lost a lot of weight. Look at that. Two notches down. What was that 50 pounds I've lost? With a checkup out of the way, I want to hear Dr. Isaac's take on the whole drug issue. What would if I were to tell you that I had severe stress levels? What, what kind of drugs could you prescribe for me to help that? More often than not, I prescribe the benzodiazepines, medicines from the Valium family. Uh -huh. What if I were to tell you I was having trouble sleeping? Ambien or, or Sonata or Lunesta. What if I were to tell you I was extremely anxious? If we're talking about long-term therapy, we'd use the SSRIs, the medicines from the Prozac family. Psychoactive pharmaceuticals are prescribed by doctors for an intended change in focus and behavior, stress level and mood, or for a reduction of pain. They're abused by over 16 million Americans for the very same reasons. If you look at the rates of prescription, the number of prescription drugs sold, it's just been going through the roof since the 1950s. So do you think we're the most uh, medicated we've ever been in history? Well, of course, because we have more medications and more choices than ever been in history. So one technique we've seen pharmaceutical companies use to get to a very big target audience is selling sickness, um, by which they actually educate the public to perceive experiences that they're having as an illness uh, that can be treated with their drug. So uh, you thought you were just shy, but actually you have an illness called shyness. It's pathological. It's more shy than you ought to be. And we can help you with that. So doctor, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we've got the government telling us what we can and can't take. Uh, we've got our friends uh, recommending things that we should or should We have commercials on TV telling us that we should go to our doctor and ask for this. How do we know, ultimately, what we should put in our body? Only you can be responsible for what goes in your body. 
so is making decisions about which drugs to use going to get any easier? It seems like in the future we'll just have more options. But will the drugs get any better? We are moving towards an era of customized drugs, which means that anything that a drug is intended to do, it will do uh, more dramatically, more effectively, um, whether you want them to or not. New research can also find new uses for old drugs. And in some cases, these old drugs might be illegal. There's currently a study at NYU that fits this profile. They're testing a Schedule I drug on terminal cancer patients in an effort to reduce end-of-life anxiety. Using this drug in research requires special permission from the DEA and a host of security measures. Pretty funny, since all our ancestors had to do was go outside and find it. That was in psilocybin. Isn't that the active ingredient in what's known as uh, magic mushrooms? That's correct. The potential therapeutic utility of these drugs uh, is very broad within psychiatry, and they potentially represent a paradigm shift within the field. So you're dealing with, with patients with some, some pretty serious issues, and you're going to give them hallucinogenic drugs. Can't, they, can't that go horribly wrong? Well, you have to be very careful. These drugs can have adverse psychological effects associated with them. Psychedelics seem to affect different people in different ways, and not always predictably so. These hallucinogenic drugs have such diverse and profound psychological effects when a human being takes them. I've already learned that drugs like psilocybin have been used to create spiritual experiences for thousands of years. Now it seems patients in this study are having similar experiences with the drug. A couple of the patients have described a benevolent godlike figure that they've had an interaction with. It seems really interesting that you're experimenting with a drug and uh, that increases, in essence, spirituality. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Someday we could maybe market it as a god pill, right? <laughs> but these are godlike pills, godlike experiences. Yeah. Amazingly, three quarters of the patients listed their psilocybin experience as the single most or top five most significant meaningful experience of their lives wow. up there with having a child. Wow. So th these are some of the most profound experiences and effects that I have seen. As we know, magic mushrooms have been used by human beings for millennia, but we still have a pretty limited understanding of how it mediates its incredibly interesting and complex psychological effects on the brain. I think we have unfortunately demonized certain classes of drugs and not allowed them to be the object of scientific study quite to the degree that they need to be. There's still so much we have to learn about how drugs affect our brains and bodies. Even the oldest drug that humans may have taken is still the subject of modern day research. Drugs have been a part of the human experience in so many ways throughout the course of history. From our spiritual search for higher meaning to our medical practices and the drugs we hope will cure us, to the global economies that formed around drugs and the new ideas that drugs may have inspired. Now we have more options than ever before, but are we healthier? Some believe drugs are a personal choice. Others think we must continue to regulate drugs to protect us from their dangers. No doubt going forward, we'll continue to re-examine our relationship with drugs, which has been a constant from the Stone Ages through today and on to tomorrow.